All right, so at the end of chapter 28 from last week, we saw uh, Jacob was sent away to go find a wife of, of, um, from Rebekah's family. And that's what he does. And he goes here, we start off in verse 1 of chapter 29. Then Jacob went on his journey and came unto the land of the people of the east. And he looked, and behold, a well in the field, and lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. And a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And thither were all the flocks gathered, and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in his place. And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? So he's saying, Where are you from? He comes across this big well, and you see these flocks of sheep you know, are lying around it. And, he, and you know, he asks them, he says, Well, where are you from? He's trying to figure out you know, where he is. Where are you from? He says, And... Um, and they said of Haran. Now Haran is where, you know, the place that Abraham came out of and was there for a while and before going into the promised land. And um, that's where, where the, the rest of, you know, Laban's family and they're all from as well. So he says, and he said unto them, Know ye Laban the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said unto them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. So he's, he's asking them, because he's looking to find um, Laban. He's looking to find that family, Rebecca's family. And, um, you know, they're saying, okay, well, do you, do you know Laban? Do you, I mean, do you know where he is? Is he well? How's it going with him? They're like, oh, yeah, he's well. We know him. And they're like, oh, by the way, here's his daughter coming right now with the sheep. So he meets Rachel for the first time. And it says in verse 7, he said, Lo, it is yet high day. Neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep and go and feed them. And they said, We cannot until all the flocks be gathered together, until they roll the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. So it said earlier on, there's this great stone on top of a well. Right, there's this well of water and there's this real big stone on top of it. And basically what they're doing is, you know, the, these people with their sheep, they come and they have to wait until they can all help to, to get this, this stone rolled off together because it's such a big, heavy stone. So they all have to, to just kind of wait around until there's enough of them to get this stone off of the well's mouth. And it says in verse 9, And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. So here he sees Rachel approach. Now remember, you know, Jacob's there to find a wife, right? He's there and he's looking for a wife out of, from basically from Laban's family, from, from that family he's got there. He already knows that, that Rebecca here is, um, or I mean, excuse me, Rachel, not Rebecca. Rachel's showing up, it's Laban's daughter, and he knows that that stone's real heavy. He's like, all right, step aside, you know, I got this. And he goes and he, and he removes, you know, pulls this great stone off of the, the well's mouth. And um, you got to think, he, Jacob was not a weakling, right? And we're going to see that also when he wrestles with the angel. And he, and he wins. He's like wrestling with the angel of God and, and he wins. And that's when he, he gets the name Israel. We're going we're gonna to see that um, soon coming up. But um, here he see him you know, opening up the, the, that great stone that's on top of the well's mouth. Jacob was not some weakling. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, he was a mama's boy because, you know, um, Isaac loved Esau, but, but um, Rebecca loved Jacob. And that, that he was this mama's boy and all this other stuff. But he clearly had a lot of strength because he was able to move this great stone. We see him uh, later on wrestling and winning. And, um, you know, he made his, his bed was just like rocks, like where his pillows, it says. So he wasn't just some, you know, he was, he was a manly man. I right, us put it that way. And he decides to, you know, when Rachel shows up, he's going he's gonna to move that that stone from off the well's mouth. And then he goes and he, it says he waters the flock. So he goes, he moves the stone and he, and he actually waters the flock for Rachel. He, you know, he, he pulls the water out and he's doing a nice thing. And it says in verse 11, And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother. 
and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. Now, I just want to point out real quick that when it says, and Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice, he didn't like, it wasn't like a passionate kiss. It wasn't, it wasn't a kiss of um, like a romantic kiss. Right? And, and, and we don't really have this in our culture so much. But people, it, it is in other cultures. If you know, there's a lot of European cultures that still do this. So like give people kisses on the cheek and, and things like that. It's a greeting. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's affectionate, but it's still a greeting. It's not, a, it's not romantic at all. Right? It would be the way that like, you'd kiss your mother or something. You know, it's not, a, not this type of a romantic kiss. And we see all throughout the New Testament, actually, when the Apostle Paul is ending a lot of his epistles. I, I copied some of them down here. Like at the end of 1 Corinthians, it says, All the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another with an holy kiss. Um, in 2 Corinthians 13, it says, Greet one another with an holy kiss. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. And then in 1 Peter 5.14, it says, Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So this is a greeting. This is something that they used when they would greet each other. It's just a kiss. So it's a normal thing. It's not like he's going up and making out with her right when he sees her. And, you know, the reason why I even bring this up is because in our culture today, we've gotten so permissive that people think that passionately kissing other people is just fine when you're not married, when it's... When, you know, when you just get to know somebody and or barely even know them at all, you know, people go to parties, they go out to clubs and all the next thing you know, they're just like making out and, and having these very romantic kisses. And that's not right. When you're not married, the Bible says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let them marry. Keeping your purity and, you know, that says even, you know, like it's good not to touch a woman. You don't want to be putting yourself in a situation where you are going to be tempted to sin, where you're going to be putting yourself, you're going to be, you know, because anyone who's, who's kissed a, well, a woman or, you know, a man the opposite gender passionately or romantically, you know that that's going to lead to other things. It's very easy to lead to other things because it's a, it's a, there's a lot of emotion involved and you're opening the door. If you're not married by, 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 by kissing like that, you're opening the door to a lot of, a lot of sin, a lot of very wicked sin with fornication or adultery. So you want to be very careful to stay away from that. And that's not what Jacob was doing when he met Rachel. I know he's looking for a wife, right? And I know he thought she was really beautiful because that's clear. But he didn't go up to her and just start making out with her. This kiss was just a greeting. He greets her and it says that, and that's why it says he lifts up his voice and wept. Like he's just... He's just real happy and joyful that, that as soon as he gets there, he finds his, you know, his family. Laban's doing well. Great, this is Rachel. And then it says, and Jacob told Rachel you know, who he was, that he's Rebekah's son. And she runs home and tells her father Laban you know, that, that, um, that Jacob's there. Let's keep reading. Verse number 13. And it came to pass, when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. See, again, I mean, see, here you see Laban kissing Jacob. It's the same way that Jacob kissed Rebecca or Rachel. I keep calling Rachel Rebecca. I got to stop doing that. <laughs> so forgive, if I keep doing that, just I'm talking about Rachel. Okay, it's a slip. Um, but it's, it's a, it was a normal thing for even men to kiss other men when it's done in that type of greeting. I don't even believe it's, a, you know, it's like a kiss on the lips. I think it's just this you know, like a different type of a kiss, a much different type of a kiss. And it's not, it has nothing to do with romance. It's a, it's a greeting. But, and, and again, you know, in, our, in our culture, in our society, we don't do that. Right? I mean, people have a lot more like, this is my space. You, know, you still get a lot of people who hugs, and every once in a while you'll get you'll get the, the the foreign aunts and the foreign grandmas, and they come up and they do the you know the greeting with the. Do you have that in in the, in the Polish culture? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. They'll do the yeah, and the, the American kids are just like yeah. like get away. <laughs> But it, it was a normal thing. And this is, you find this all throughout the Bible that this was, this was a common thing. You know, there's nothing wrong with that or nothing weird about it. It was just, a, it's a greeting. Um, and even, you know, even to the point where, you know, Laban, give, you know, he's happy, he's excited to see his nephew. And, uh, you know, he greets him, brings him to his house. He's being real hospitable to him. 
And it says in verse 14, And Laban said to him, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of a month. So he's staying with him for about a month. And, uh, you know, Laban's opening up his doors, being real hospitable to him. And then verse 15, it says, And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? So he's staying there for a month. He's obviously working. He's helping out with whatever needs to be done. And he's saying, look, you know, we're family. It says he's his brother. And you have to be aware of this, too. When the Bible talks about people, you know, people saying it's so-and-so's it's -so brother, brother has a tendency to be to use very loosely. Brother means, in many cases, it just means like a relative. Now, and sometimes it means a literal brother, you know, both of the same parents and their, their siblings. But oftentimes you'll see, yeah, a brother can cross generations. It's an uncle and a nephew. It's, a, you know, it's cousins and they'll say they're brothers. So just be aware of that when you read the Bible. It's not a mistake. It's just a usage of the word brother. Like we're brethren, right? And we're brothers in Christ because we have the same father, right? But um, it's, a, it's a looser term for, for family. And... Um, so right here he says, thou art my brother. He's saying, look, we're family. Why, would you, why, why should you just serve me for nothing? Is what he's saying. He said, I'll, I'll pay you. Tell, tell me what, what I should pay you. And it says in verse 16, And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. Now, I've heard people say that, like, because it says here, Leah was tender-eyed. What does that really mean? I mean, tender, soft, right? She was soft-eyed. Some people say that means that she was cross-eyed. I don't necessarily quite buy that. I think what, it's, what the Bible is using here in these words is a, is a very nice way of saying that she wasn't that good-looking. Because it's contrasted. When it says that Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored, it says... She was tender-eyed, but she's beautiful. So it's, it's contrasting the one versus the other. So the opposite of being beautiful is, you know, being a little homely, right? Not quite as attractive. And I think when it says that Leah was tender-eyed, that's all. I don't think you need to really read into that any more than just that she probably wasn't the, you know, the guy's top pick because she wasn't that pretty, right? But, that, you know, in the Bible saying she was tender-eyed. And... Um, and it says in verse 18, and Jacob loved Rachel. So he, he was, she was the first one that he met when he got there. And, and for whatever reason, I mean, she's probably real beautiful. He loves Rachel. And, it's, and so he says to Laban, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. So he's saying, okay, you want to know what, what I think my wages should be? He says, I'll work for you for seven years if you'll give me your daughter to be my wife. Now, the, we've strayed very far from the way that, that things used to be as far as, you know, w especially in our society, our culture, with the, the feminist movement and, and people really, you know, Satan attacking the roles of the family, the roles of men, the roles of women. Everything is getting mixed around from the clothing that we wear to the, to the, to the role in the family, to, the, to working, to just, just everything has just gotten turned upside down. And, you know, I've already preached an entire sermon not too long ago, about a month ago, on uh, Numbers chapter 30, that goes over the, the vows and how the father, if he hears his daughter make a vow unto God, he can dis disallow it. He can say, no, that's not good, because the, the dad has that ultimate authority over those things that his daughter, so not just his daughter, but also his wife. And I explained in that sermon, I'm not going to re-preach it, how that, you know, this is where our traditions come from of the father giving away the daughter in the marriage. Because it's, it's founded in truth and, and you know, the, the, the dad is the one who needs to give approval because, see, in God's design for the family, I know this, is going to, this flies in the face of what people believe today, but God's design for the family is that the women are always taken care of. The women are provided for. The men are the ones who go out and work. The men, you know, and obviously little kids, you know, the, the dad pays for everything. The dad is the provider. The husband is the one providing for his wife and also for all of his children. But as the, as the, as the 
male children, the sons start to grow older, they need to learn how to work and to be providers like dad is because that is their role and that is their job. So they need to, to learn all these skills to work and to be a hard worker. And they are going to need to learn to be, a, um, to be a ruler in their own household. And they learn different things than the women do. Now the daughters, and notice in Numbers 30, and I didn't really touch on this at the time, it says that the wife and the daughters that the, the husband is able to disallow, but it doesn't say that the sons. It doesn't say if the son makes a vow unto God that the father is able to disallow that vow. And now, and now here's the thing, and we all, I always like to bring this up because we're so turned around and so backwards. It doesn't mean that, that women are less valuable or that you have like you know, less rights or whatever. It's a different role. It's a different job that, that the woman has to play. Now, in God's role, I think that women are actually valued very highly because of the fact that you're being provided for and taken care of and somebody's always helping to watch over you and protect you and, and, and take care of you, right? You have that comfort. So daughters will have that comfort of their dad looking out for what's best for them. And because God made us different and our minds are different and, and it is a, a fact that it's a little bit easier for women to be deceived than men, Eve was deceived easier. You know, Adam, it doesn't say, was deceived. He willfully sinned when his wife brought him the fruit. But Eve was deceived by the serpent. And it's just always been that way. See, women have a much more nurturing, compassionate you know, side to them where it's easier to even allow themselves to be deceived because they're kind of opening up being very caring and loving towards people because that's the way they need to be with their children. That's the way that God designed them, right? Whereas men are a lot more protective and suspicious and thinking more about, you know, about other people's motives and things like that more than women. It doesn't mean that women are stupid. It's just you're, you're inclined to other things and you're, it's easier to be deceived because of that. But... So the way that God designed it was that the father, the man is looking out for the protection of his family and for the protection of his daughters. And since the, since the man is going to be the one providing for his daughters, he's the one that's going to say yes or no on whether or not a person's going to be able to marry his daughter because he's been responsible for his whole life. And obviously a, a parent should be totally loving their child. Anyone that's not a reprobate or you know, any normal person loves their children. And is going to love him to death, and God made him made us that way, you know, so that the the father looks out for them and their well being, and needs to give his approval, even on a vow before God, and a vow like marriage is a big vow. That's why, even in this country, up until relatively recently, you know, men would go and try to win favor with the father of the girl that he wanted to court or date or you know, and ultimately marry. The, the, the man would go and try to get permission. Can I take your daughter out? Can I speak to your daughter? I want, you know, all these different things. And ultimately, when they decided he wanted to propose to the wife, he would go and get the father's blessing first. We look at that. I mean, people, they will just laugh at that. They go, oh, what's that? Like, leave it to beaver? Is that, you know, are you just way back, stuck in the 50s or something? Look, that was righteous when people would do that. And that was, that was very godly because this is the way that God designed it. And it's this, this giving, you know, when it comes time for my girls to, to find a husband and to get married, I'm going to be very, very careful that they are not going to get some deadbeat loser that they're going to go off and marry, you know. So I'm going to try to be as protective as I can to make sure that they're marrying someone that's a good man, that's going to take care of them, that's not going to send them off to work and split up their family because the best way for their marriage to last and to be successful and be happy and to be God-fearing is to, is, is to have the husband who's leading the house, who's a hard worker, who's going to serve God and be able to provide for his family. And that's going to be the, the type of man that I will give my blessing to when they come to, to marry one of my daughters. And God made it that way because the father is able to you know, use some discernment in that, in that realm. Not just because like daughters are just treated as property. No. It's not because you don't, you know, like, oh, they're just second class citizens. No, it's the, it's the love and care for them 
and the, va the high value that you place on them is why God made it that way. And as, that's what I'm saying. You know, when, when, with my wife, she's, she's valued very highly because I'm going to go off and work my tail off to try to, you know, try to please her, try to please, you know, just do everything for them so that she can stay home and do her job with the kids and do her job with the household. It's, it's an elevated ro role, I believe. But we see here, so that's what Jacob is negotiating with Laban, because Laban is, is Rachel's father. And he's like, man, you know, I, I love Rachel. I want to marry her. And look at, well, you want to talk about value. He's like, I'll work for you for seven years. That's a pretty high value. I think he valued Rachel pretty high. Think about seven years of your income. Seven years of, of this hard work. And Jacob was a good worker. He's a strong man. He's able to do a lot. And we see how he's blessed, you know, as we, as we read further, when he's working for Laban, he's blessed, you know, his flocks, everything's just, just multiplying and he's doing this great job. So seven years, and that's, that's not like saving stuff up from, that's, that's seven years just to, just to, to be allowed to, to marry Rachel. As, and it's, it's called a dowry, right? It's a gift that's given. Now, in Bible times, men would present a gift to the father, you know, as a, like kind of receiving permission and to get a blessing to Mary's daughter. Um, we see this in Genesis 34. Flip over if you would. Keep your finger in Genesis 29. We're going to see here, even the heathen would practice this. Now, it's kind of weird. You know, I looked up dowry in the, in the dictionary. The, the, rever the role has been reversed to where the woman gives the gift unto the husband is what it says in, as like a dictionary definition as part of a, a dowry for like a marriage. But that's not the way it is in the, in the biblical times and in the Bible stories. It's the opposite. It's the man giving a dowry unto the father and not the wife giving a dowry unto the, unto the husband. Now there is one time where the word dowry is used where Leah is saying God has given me a good dowry because she's had these children and it's where um, you know she's thinking that well Jacob's gonna love me more now because I have this great dowry because God has blessed me with this so the word itself is not you know it's, it's the word dowry is basically like a gift that's what the word literally means but when you apply it towards a marriage in the Bible times it's the man bringing you know, giving a gift to the father. And we see here in, in Genesis 34, look at verse 11, and it says, And Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, and her father is Jacob, so in this story it's, it's Jacob and, her, and unto her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as ye shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. And in this story, basically what happens is this guy, this guy Shechem, he commits fornication with Dinah. And Dinah was one of the daughters of Jacob. Okay. And I don't, you know, some people will say he raped her, but I don't believe that. I believe that it was consensual and that they lied together and he loved her and he wanted to marry her and everything. And I'm not going to go into all the reasons why um, I don't believe it was rape. But some people will point out, the scoffers will say, oh yeah, when you rape someone in the Bible, then it says that you have to marry him. And they, they try to scoff, like, no, that's not what the Bible says. You know, they just don't understand the language that's being used, the English language, literally, they don't understand. And when it says that they lie with someone, it, you know, they think that it means that they were forced and that they were raped. And that's not what it means. But, um, but what happens in the story, so Shechem lies with Dinah, because Dinah goes out, she's like, I want to go see the, the girls of the land, you know, like, like she starts going and mingling with the, with the heathen and, and, and going to hang out with these girls in the, in the, in the heathen land. And she ends up um, committing fornication with Shechem. Well, Shechem loves her, and he's talking unto his dad, and he's like, Dad, you got to get me this, this girl to wife. And he's saying, you know, whatever it is, like, I'll pay it, I'll do whatever, I want her to be my wife. Well, Jacob's children, they're all, you know, they're all upset. They're angry because this guy defiled their sister because he commit fornication with her and they know that's not right and they're real upset. 
right? So, but he goes unto him. He's like, let me find grace in your eyes. He's like, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And I'll give it to you for a dowry. So that's one example here. And then there's um, in Exodus 22, God actually gives a provision for something like this to happen or when, when something like this happens. This very example, it's spelled out in the law. In Exodus 22, the Bible says, and if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed, so someone who's not engaged, someone who's not married, if a man entices a maid and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuse to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. So in, in the Mosaic law, in God's law, the Bible says that, okay, look, if a man entices a maid, that's not rape, first of all. If, if, someone, if he's enticing her, right, he's, try, he's talking into her, he's trying to get her to commit fornication with him. She's not betrothed, she's not married to anyone, she's not a spouse to anyone, so it's not adultery, it's not that type of a crime. But he's saying, okay, if a guy is trying, you know, he ends up sleeping with a girl, well, the right thing to do is says he shall surely endow her to be his wife. So if he, if, if you know, in the, in, the, in the law, the Bible says, look, if you commit fornication with someone, the right thing for the guy to do is to endow her now to be his wife. Because you've already come together, you've already committed that sin of fornication, now you just need to get married now. You need to make it right because that act is something that's only supposed to be for people who are married. So he's saying that he needs to endow her to be his wife. If her father utterly refused, though, and see, this is where the dad comes in. Because if the dad says, no, you're not going to marry my daughter. He has that position. He has that authority to say no. Then he still needs to pay according to the dowry of virgins. Because here's the thing. Now, if he says no, well, his daughter has been humbled. She's no longer a virgin. And people used to think that virginity was an important aspect. Virginity was very important. People wanted to marry virgins. You would keep yourself pure and you'd want to marry someone else who was pure because it was valued very highly as it ought to be. So when someone finds out, well, now this girl's not going to be, you know, she's kind of taken down a notch as far as, as far as her attractiveness unto men, especially good godly men who want to marry someone. They, they want to marry a virgin. They want to marry someone who's pure. Now she's been defiled, so it's going to be a lot harder for her to marry. And because this guy committed this act of fornication with her, then the, in the law it says he needs to pay the money that the father would receive for the dowry of virgins for when he does give her away marriage because, um, because of what he did, because of that act. Um, which is exactly what should have happened here in that story with Dinah. If, Rachel, if, um, if Jacob were to say, nope, you cannot marry my daughter, then Shechem would have had, should have, according to the Mosaic law, paid the dowry because he, he commit fornication with Dinah. And that's what the Bible is saying here. And then um, the, another example of a dowry is with King David. When before, you know, after he killed Goliath, but um, he was serving King Saul, and Saul was going to give him his daughter, Michael, to be wife. And we'll re I'll read this from 1 Samuel 18 for you. The Bible says, And Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now therefore be the king's son in law. And Saul's servants spake these words in the ears of David. And David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed? And the servants of Saul told him, saying, of this, On this manner spake David. And Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but an hundred foreskins of the Philistines, to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So, you know, Saul's being deceptive here anyways, but David's looking at this and he's saying, you know, this is the king, the king's daughter. To marry into that is a big deal. He's like, do you think this is just a light thing for me to take her, you know, to take his daughter to be my wife? He's like, I'm poor. I can't afford to give this great dowry unto the king to marry his daughter. He's like, I'm a poor man and I'm lightly esteemed. You know, he's like, I'm not that well liked. And... So when Saul hears of this, because he's trying to, he's, Saul's using his own daughter to, to trap David 
because he wants David gone because he's already jealous over the people. He, you know, Saul feels threatened already with his kingdom. And because everybody was saying, you know, when they sang the songs that Saul would kill his thousands and David his ten thousands after he killed Goliath. And, um, you know, that made Saul angry and, and thinking that David had the heart of the people and all this other stuff. And so he wants him just gone. But he doesn't, at this point, he's not doing it himself. Later on, he starts, like, just blatantly trying to kill him. At this point, he's saying, okay, well, I understand that he's poor, so here's, here's the deal. You go get me, you know, the hundred foreskins of the Philistines. Basically, kill a hundred Philistines because they were at war with, with the Philistines. Then that will be considered your dowry. You don't have to pay me any money, but that will be better than, than some amount of money you could give me. That's the deal he made. And, of course, David goes out and does it happily. And, and comes back and then Saul's like, oh, he did, you know, like he's thinking he's just going to be killed, right? Going out to kill a hundred of these guys. But David does it and comes back and um, he's given Michael to, to wife. So we see here, you know, all these different examples, again, show you that there is, there is definitely a high price, a high value on women and on finding a good godly woman, especially to be your wife. Jacob gave seven years of his life, of his labor, just to be able to marry Rachel. <clears throat> Let's keep reading here. Verse 21 of uh, Genesis 29. Go back to Genesis 29 if you're not there already. Or verse 20, the Bible says... Um, no, verse 19. Okay, that's what we left on verse 18. Verse 19. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. So Laban says, Okay, that's fair enough. Seven years. He's like, It's better for me to give her to you anyways. You know, your family. I, I, you know, I don't want her just to give her to someone else. So yeah, that, that's fine. So stay with me. Abide with me. Verse 20. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love. So Jacob really loves Rachel, right? He's not like, like he's just so in love with her that, he, I mean, seven years is kind of a, it's a long time. We're just coming up on our seventh year anniversary. Seven years is a long, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> seven years is quite a significant amount of time, but he loves her so much. It's like, it's like nothing. You know, it just, it just went by to him. Like it's just a few days because he's just so excited. He's so happy to be around her. But think of the integrity also that, me, that, that Jacob has. And that people had, and the, the, the regard that people had for women, for purity, for marriage. That he's able to work for seven years to be around her, to be in the family, to be, you know, to be living there, and to not touch her, to not do anything inappropriate, and to stay there and to keep themselves pure for seven whole years. And when he loves her so much, to, to do everything the right way. To work the right way, to you know, to to fulfill that dowry, get the the consent of her father, and be able to marry um, Rachel. That's a long time to work, and it shows a lot of love. He loved her greatly. Verse twenty one. And Jacob said unto Laban, "Give me my wife." For my days are fulfilled that I may go in under. So now he's saying, you know, once his seven years are up, he's saying, okay, it's time to pay up, right? Like, I've done all this work for you. Now it's time to give me my wife. Verse 22, and Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. So Laban said, okay, well, we're going to have a big party, right? We're going to have a big celebration for this marriage. Verse 23, and it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went in under her. So what Laban does is he, is he switches out Leah for Rachel and, and he brings Leah unto, unto Jacob. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always wondered, how does Jacob like not know? Right? Like it must have just been real dark in the tent. Right? It's just real late. Obviously, they don't got light switches. So, I mean, maybe he was already there and, you know, and, and um, you know, Laban just comes and, and you know, brings her... I don't know. I don't know how it all happened, but he was tricked. And you know what? Maybe also, you think, think about this, because we know, and I covered this when, uh, was it last week or two weeks ago, how 
Jacob's reaping what he's sown. He was the deceiver. He's the one that tricked Isaac into getting that blessing and stealing Esau's blessing. I mean, he said that he was his brother. He made all these lies. Just And he was, he was deceitful. Now, I think if God wanted to, if Jacob hadn't done any of that stuff, God could have made something happen so that Jacob wouldn't have wouldn't have um, sealed the deal on that on that you know in, in line with with Leah. He probably could have made it so that he would become aware of of wait this isn't Rachel, right in time, and that God was fully capable of, of making something like that happen. But I believe that God allowed this to happen and for for Jacob to be deceived because of the deception that he had already done, and that and I think that might be part of why. He didn't know. You know, like maybe there was this kind of this guy had this cloud over him where he like didn't, he wasn't thinking right and, and he wasn't able to um, determine that, that it wasn't Rachel. But whatever the reason, you know, again, that's just my opinion or my thought on it. Um, we know that he's reaping what he sowed, but um, you know, the Bible doesn't explicitly say that that's why. But that, that would seem like it makes a lot of sense to me as to why he wasn't able to figure out that it was Leah instead of Rachel, especially after being around him for seven years. Right, so um, I think that's a that's a plausible explanation, is because God's allowing it to for him to to reap what he's sown. So let's keep reading. It says, um, verse twenty four, and Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah his maid for an handmaid, and it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah, and he said to Laban. What is this thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? Saying, Why did you trick me? You know, didn't I work for you for Rachel? Verse 26, And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. So Laban makes up some lame excuse saying, Well, you know, I've, I have to marry off the firstborn daughter before I can marry off the, the younger one. And he's, you know, that's just his excuse. Verse 27, fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, and he gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. So Laban says, okay, okay, okay. He says, look, give her her week. You know, that when they would get married, there'd be this, this week like celebration they would, you know, where they would stay together. And he's like, fulfill her week, her duty, you know, her duty of marriage, your duty of marriage, and, and give her that, that whole first week, and then I'll give you Rachel also. You could have both, but you're going to have to work for me another seven years. Right? So Jacob agreed to that, and he's like, fine, because he really loved Rachel, so he wanted to have her, and he, now he's married to Leah. And there's nothing he could do about that. Once he, once he had gone in unto her, they had to, you know, like their husband and wife, and that's, that's what sealed the deal is that, that consummation of the marriage. Part of that marriage is that coming together. That is, is what, what solidifies the marriage. So people can be espoused to another person where, yes, you're married, but you haven't fully consummated that marriage when you come together. And that's what he did um, with Leah. They, you know, they consummated a marriage, and they were considered married. So that's the only solution then was for, for Rachel to be given as well, for Jacob to have two wives. Now, I'm going to go over a little bit the subject of polygamy because the Bible is against polygamy. Now, Jacob here, he agrees. Laban and Jacob agree that, that it's fine for Jacob to have two wives, right? I mean, that's the deal that they make. And people will read these stories and they'll think, well, because it's in the Bible, because Jacob, and Jacob become, goes on to become Israel, Right, a very, a very important man, one of the great men of faith in the Bible, and he was. But they see something like this. Well, if Jacob did this, then, then it must be okay. And right? they think God just endorses polygamy, but God doesn't. Turn, if you would, back to Genesis chapter two. And what's interesting is you would think that this wouldn't be that big of a deal in our culture today because no one's really marrying multiple wives except for the the crazy fundamentalist Mormons. Right, that that they they practice polygamy, but um, now, after the Supreme Court decision on 
you know, just, just marriage can be whatever. It's no longer like this definition of a man and a woman. Like, that's kind of an important definition to have as far, if you're going to legally regard a marriage, like if the government's going to recognize and say this is a marriage in the state's eyes, for whatever reason, I mean, whether it's taxes, what, it doesn't matter what the purpose is, but if you're just going to say this is a marriage, how about for the marriage of divorce, right? Because that's something the state gets involved in as well and something that they should get involved in as far as the, um, you know, the, the penalty for adultery, the Bible says, is the death penalty, and that's something that, that the state would have to get involved in, what the government would have to be involved in. So, you know, the, there has to be some formal definition of what a marriage even is, right? And for the law, for forever in this country, it was a man and a woman, which is the definition, which is a biblical definition. And if you go back to Genesis 2, we'll see that. But now, since they've changed that, well, that throws everything up in the air. Why does it have to be anymore? Now, now, why does it have to be between only two people? Why can't you have a marriage of three people? Because we're not sticking to the original definition anymore. Now you say, well, a man and a man could be married. Well, how about a man and a mouse? How about a man and a dog? Why not? Right? If you say, well, there's love. It's love. Hey, love wins. I love my dog. I love my dog so much, we want to get married. Right? And that, I mean, that's what the Solomon said. The, the Supreme Court already, has already approved a beast to get married. So that's what the Bible refers to the Sodomites as, is, is natural brute beasts. So we already have beasts allowed to get married, so why not have a man get married to his dog? Or a different kind of beast. What's to stop that? Well, and I already saw an article that said there's a guy in Montana or somewhere that's, that wants, is applying to, to marry multiple wives. So now all of a sudden, because the Supreme Court basically is just throwing out definitions and saying that, nope, you know, which they already have this stinking agenda to push all of this, this, this garbage, the sodomite agenda, the liberal agenda, to destroy the family, to destroy religion, to destroy this culture because it's all run by Satan. But, um, They've got this plan. So that's why they allowed it to come through. But that opens up the door now for all kinds of things to happen. So let's just go and, and figure out what the Bible says about these issues. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18. With the creation of Adam and Eve, the Bible reads in verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Notice it says, and help. Help. That word an is, is singular. It's one. A. You know, an help. I'm going to make a helper for him. And that's what, you know, he brings all the beasts and none of them are good enough. Right? So there, there goes your, there goes my thought about, you know, marrying a dog. Right? Because none of the beasts were a good, a, a proper help for Adam. But jump down to verse 23. This is after then. So God's like, okay, he makes Adam sleep. He pulls out a, a rib and, and he forms woman. Right? Verse 23 says, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Not wives, plural, but you know, you, the reason why you leave mother, father and mother is so you could cleave unto your wife. Because you have a father and mother. You leave that household of your father and mother, not mothers, not plural, your father, your mother, and you go out and you marry your wife. And that's what, what you do. And that's what, what and it says, and they shall be one flesh. And in this scripture, it says, they just taught, referring to them too, they shall be one flesh. But in Ephesians 5, it spells out, they too shall be one flesh. In Ephesians 5.31, the Bible reads, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. It doesn't say though they three, they four, they five. It's they two. Marriage is, you know, between a man and a woman as a, according to everything in Scripture. That's what God has ordained. That's what God has wanted. And that's what God has allowed. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 17. We're going to see some, some other evidence now showing us that the Bible, you know, there's actually laws against polygamy. God did not intend for man to have more than one wife. 
Now it happened, but just because things happen in the Bible doesn't make it right. I mean, Moses killed a man. Does that mean it's right? What he did was right. David committed adultery. Does that make it right because he did it? No, it means he's a sinner. Jacob had multiple wives. Does that make it right? No. Deuteronomy 17, look at verse 15. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee. He's talking about when they appoint a king in Israel. He's saying there's going to be a time where you're going to want to have a king just like all the other nations around you, even though you don't need a king because God's the king. But he says, when you do, because I know it's going to happen, this is who you should appoint. This is, these are the rules for having a kin. king. So God, God has in here established you know, rules and laws that pertain to things that people do that are sinful. And just because you can say, oh, well, what, why would it be in the law then? God must be endorsing it. No, God's not endorsing. He's just saying, if you do these things, these are the laws that are going to govern what you do. So he, he didn't, God never wanted them to have a king. But because he knows their hearts, because he knows how they are, he's saying, okay, well, you, I, you know, you're not supposed to have a king, but if you do, this is how you do it. So verse 15, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. So he's saying not, not a foreigner. You can't allow a foreigner. And this is one of the things that, you know, the, the, in the Constitution, it's written that the President of the United States is not allowed to be a foreigner. You've heard a lot about that lately with Obama and his birth certificate and all that other nonsense. But um, it's not necessarily nonsense, but you know, there's, there's a good reason for that. And, and in the Bible it's saying too, look, you're not going to have a foreigner be your king. It's got to be someone who's a native of the, you know, a native brother. Verse 16 though, look at what it says here. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that they should multiply horses, for as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Verse 17, neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. So these are all the admonitions. He's saying, you know, don't multiply all these, these horses. And the horse is like military strength. Or he doesn't need to multiply all of these horses. He doesn't need to multiply, he says here not to multiply wives. And the reason why is that having multiple wives is going to turn your heart away. Which is exactly what we saw King Solomon do. And not to multiply silver and gold in abundance, right? So the, the, the king, he's saying, don't, don't, you know, the king shouldn't let himself get too rich. Because all of these things are too much for people to handle. You know, a man can't handle having multiple wives. He's going to turn his heart away. A man can't have, handle having too much silver and gold, too many riches. It's going to turn his heart away from God. It's just what's going to happen because we're human, because we have this sinful flesh nature that's going to drive us away. And he's saying, these are admonitions. Don't do these things. And specifically for the king, you say, oh, well, that was just for the king. You know, he's not to multiply his wives. Well, why would it be any different for anyone else? I mean, it, doesn't, it just makes sense. 1 Kings chapter 11, we see um, this, this exact thing play out with Solomon. In 1 Kings 11, the Bible reads, But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go in unto them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David, his father. The Bible, you know, you may have a bunch of examples of people who have multiple wives. But the Bible is never for it, and we see, we see scriptures that would be contrary to that. Obviously, in... Um, Deuteronomy 17 saying that the king's not allowed to multiply wives unto himself. Polygamy is not okay in the Bible. Look at verse, uh, chapter, Genesis 29, verse 30, the Bible reads, And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, 
and served with him yet seven other years. So right away now, we're going to see problems as a result. You know, when you have multiple wives, you know, men would foolishly might think, oh man, how great would it be? I have more than one woman, right? Wrong. Wrong. Having one marriage, and look, the, 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 with the divorce rates, what is today? Having one marriage is hard enough as it is, right? Staying dedicated, staying married to another person, it's work. It doesn't just come super easily. You both have to work together at your marriage to keep it going. And that's why we celebrate when people have 40, 50, 60 year anniversaries because amen, congratulations, you know, great job. You've done a great work together, staying together for so long. It's something to be very happy about and, and to celebrate. But marriage is hard enough as it is. Why would you want, you know, why do you think it's going to be any better to have more than one? You know, more than one, well, I'm going to be married to this person, this person, this person. Look, you're going to bring in, all you're going to do is bring in more, you're going to multiply problems to yourself. And we see right away that it says he loved Rachel more than Leah. That's not a good environment to have where, you know, you love one versus over the other. And if you were to have more than one wife, you know that's going to happen. You're not just going to love everybody equally. There's going to be someone that you're more partial to, right? And that's just going to cause a lot of strife. Now, God does put provisions in the law, as I mentioned earlier. And in this case, more for the protection of the hated wife in the event that a man does have multiple wives. He's saying, look, God, you know, God doesn't promote polygamy and having multiple wives. But if it happens, there are things in the law that he put. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 21. And this case of Jacob here is a pretty good example because he loved Rachel more even though Leah was, would be considered the legitimate wife, the first wife, right? She was the one he was married to first even though he loved Rachel more. Deuteronomy 21 verse 15 reads, If a man have two wives, one beloved and the other hated, right? The same exact example with Jacob. And they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. And if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, for he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. So in God's law, he's saying, look, if you have multiple wives, and it, it, it follows exactly with this case, one's loved, the other one's hated. And Leah, Leah is the one that has children first. Rachel doesn't have a child until much, much, much later on. <coughs> and so Leah, the firstborn, was born of Leah. And she was the hated one. So this law is going to apply to Jacob. And the law is saying that, look, the firstborn is truly the firstborn, regardless of who has it. Right? So if you say because, well, he loves Rachel so much, right? He loves her so much, so he wants the child, the son that was born unto Rachel, to get the double inheritance and to bless him because that was a result of the book. The law says no. The Bible says no. Nope, you can't do that. The double portion needs to go unto your truly firstborn. That's what, that's what the, God's word says. Now, having multiple wives only causes problems. I mean, you see this, when you love one more than another, you're going to start having problems. But look at the examples of the men that had multiple wives, and look at the problems that they had. Anybody who has, who's, you know, recorded having multiple wives, they all, you know, where there's anything even written about it, you can see a lot of problems. Starting back with Abraham. Remember when Abraham took Hagar unto him to be his wife, and Ishmael was born? What happened? There's strife, there's conflict, there's conflict between Sarah and Hagar. And uh, we read this back in Genesis 16, but in Genesis 16, 5, the Bible reads, And Sarai I said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. So you have this conflict, you have this fighting going on now between the women. Right? Because they have the same man, you know, and she's like, oh, yeah, well, I conceived. I had a child. So now she's, she's looking at Sarah with despite and it just causes conflict. David and Michael. Remember, David, Michael was, a, was his first wife. That was his legitimate wife. That's what, that's what he, that's Saul's daughter. 
But then later on when he was on the run from Saul, he picked up some more wives. He married Abigail. He married some other wives. And then he came back and uh, finally recovered Michael. She was given to another man to be a husband. That was a whole messed up situation. But we see in 2 Samuel chapter 6, one of the things that happens in that relationship. It says in verse 20, Then David returned to bless his household, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. And David said unto Michael, It was before the Lord, which chose me before thy father and before all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel, therefore will I play before the Lord. So, you know, Michael sees David dancing down there, and she gets upset about what he's doing, and, you know, they have this fight, right? Okay, that's one thing, but look at what David does in verse 22. It says, And I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be base in mine own sight. And of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. Basically, what David did, because she had his wife, is he like put her away and didn't have any more relationships with her as his wife. Now, he wouldn't have done that if, he, if that's the only wife he was married to. It, you know, he wouldn't have done something so wicked, something so vile, as he called it himself. So base and so vile, just, just to put her away so that she has no children now because because he decided not to have any relations with her because they got in this fight and she would, you know, whatever. Um, we already read about Solomon and his, you know, thousand wives and concubines that he had and the problems that that made in his life and turning his heart away. And then we're going to see even more problems with Jacob and his wives because it's not just Leah and Rachel. We're going to see that he gets the handmaids as well. And they all get involved. And there's all these problems back and forth. And Jacob's coming in from the field and, you know, these going to say, oh, no, I've, you know, I've hired you. And, like, they, you know, they fight over him. And there's this constant battle going on. And look, that is not going to be a fun household to live in. Having these multiple wives is just going to cause a lot more stress, a lot more headache, a lot more agony. It's never a good idea to take on multiple wives. And I, and I think that's very clearly stated in the, in the Bible. You see all these examples, all of them negative, you know, all these, these bad things that happen as a result. But look at verse, uh, go back here in Genesis 29. Let's jump down to verse 31. Because even in bad situations, you know, for example, Leah was kind of put in a bad situation. We, you know, we don't know how willing she was and wanted to really, you know, marry Jacob and, you know, be part of that deception. We don't know. But she ended up being, you know, uh, I'm sure she loved him. I mean, she, look, it seems like she, she, she liked him. But, um... You know, even if you could say, well, she was kind of responsible, you know, people find themselves in situations that are just not, not great situations to be in, right? Not ideal. But even in those bad situations, you need to do what is right, and God can still bless you. You know, make the best of where you're at. You're, you know, you're married already, like Leah was. I mean, they're married, and I can get, you know, divorce is an option, so she needs to make the best of it. And look at verse 31. We're going to just finish off the rest of this chapter. By reason, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So God can make things right. You know, even though you're in a particular bad situation, God sees it and says, you know what? That's not right. Leah shouldn't be hated. So he's blessing her by opening up her womb and giving her children and giving her a blessing of having children. And again, another example of God opening up the womb. God allowing for the conception to happen. God allowing for the barrenness of Rachel to happen. Verse 32, And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. And she conceived again and bare a son, and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again and bare a son, and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. Now, look, after three sons... She's still struggling and dealing with the fact that she's hated her husband. She's like, well, maybe now he'll finally love me and be joined to me. You know, like, like after each of these children, she's saying, 
Wow, look at God really sees what's going on. God sees how hate it. Maybe this, you know, and her heart's still still in it. Like maybe he'll, you know, he'll, he'll cleave to me and you know, he'll love me the way that he ought to. And God keeps blessing her in verse 35. Then she conceived again and bare a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing. Now Nobody I know is in this situation where you're married, you know, you have, there's multiple wives and you've got to deal with this type of conflict with your, your husband. But I mean, some, you know what, some women are in a, in a situation, maybe it's not marriage, but their husband is, is adulterous. And they're at home and they're with the children, and, you know, and he's going off and doing all these other things, right? And so what does the woman do in that situation? And I've even had people ask me, you know, what should I do, especially being the wife? Because look, if there's a problem in the household and the wife is doing things, the husband needs to, to step up and rule his household well. And needs to just take charge of the situation and try to de you know, and, and deal with it because he has the authority to, to be able to handle the situation a little bit better than the woman does. But what about the woman? What about the godly woman who, you know, she's trying to do things right and her husband's the one that's going on. You know, she can't just like take charge of the household. That's not right for her to usurp that authority. That's not been given her, even if she's like, you know, right about, about serving God and things like that. And, and even if she is spiritually mature, or maybe your husband's not even saved or something like that, it's still not right to take on that role that hasn't been given to you. It's not, it's not right to usurp that authority. So what happens? You know, maybe you're married to an unbeliever or someone, someone who's real backslidden. You can't just start ruling the house. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7 gives us some good advice for, situa for, for tougher situations between the, the husband and wife. For tougher situations where, you know, it's like, you know, what, what am I supposed to do here? 1 Corinthians 7, look at verse 12. The Bible reads, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman, which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Through verse 16. For what knowest thou... O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Now, this is specifically talking about a believer with an unbeliever. And he's saying, look, don't go out looking for a divorce. You know, stay together. Now, if it gets so much where the unbelieving leaves, he's like, well, just let them depart. Now, he doesn't say it's right for you to go out and get remarried or anything like that. And he's not encouraging divorce. But he's saying, look, try to, try to make it work. Try to stay together because how do you know whether or not you're going to save your spouse? In 1 Peter 3, flip over to 1 Peter 3. Because 1 Peter 3 gives us a great example of the godly woman and how this can come about and, what, and the things that she can really, you know, the type of attitude and behavior she can have to try to get this to happen, to try to, you know, bring that salvation or at least get her husband back right with God. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're start reading in verse number 1, the Bible reads, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So he's saying, look, be the best godly woman that you can be. And, and the way that you do that is by being in subjection. Don't think, you know, like your husband's doing all this stuff, is wrong and everything. 
it's not going to be helpful for you to just start rebuking him and just getting in his face and just, you know, and like being his mom. Right? He's saying, be submissive. And, you know, it says that they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Keep yourself holy and pure. Keep your, keep your conversation, you know, on the Bible, on the things of God. It says, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. You're doing what's right. Hey, you're outward adorning. You're not as worried about your appearance as you are about that ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which, is, which, in, the, which in the sight of God is of great price. And he's saying that this is exactly how the holy women behaved. This is how Sarah behaved. You know, when she treated her husband with so much respect. And you may not even be able to understand why, but when you, when you as a woman can, can fill that, that role of the submissive wife, you know, that might get through to your husband who is in a lot of error and doing a lot of wrong. And by you doing, being the best Christian that you can be, in the sense that you're living up to what God has, has ordained for you to do and for you to be and for how you should act, that can go a long way and speak volumes just through your behavior. You know, um, it could help to, to cause the fighting to cease and, and you know, a lot of things to, um, to just be made better. It's a, it's a good um, example in 1 Peter chapter 3 that will help you to to be in that situation or what, if you want to know what to do. Now, the last point I'm just going to make is what's real interesting is that at the end of his life, you know, even though Leah was hated and there's all these problems and everything, at the end of his life, Jacob actually commands to be buried with Leah. And he gives her that, that honor of, you know, of them being buried side by side, you know, in that tomb. In uh, Genesis 49, he gives a charge. Uh, Israel gives a charge concerning his body. In verse 29, he says, And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron, the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron, the Hittite, for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. So he had already chosen when Leah died. He's going to put her in that, in that tomb, in that place where... His, you know, forefathers and, and their wives were buried. That's where Leah's, you know, finally achieved, you know, in her death or whatever, he, she achieved a place of honor with, with Jacob. And he did, you know, he, he did end up loving her. Um, she wasn't hated her whole life. And, I, I mean, obviously it was before her death. He had already chosen to bury her before he was even dead in that place. And he knew that's where he was going to want to be laid. So uh, that's why we're going to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. For the Bible and for this great chapter, dear Lord, I pray that you would please just um, help us all to keep our heads on straight in this wicked culture, in this wicked society, dear Lord, where um, there's so many attacks on the family, on gender roles, and on everything else, dear Lord. Um, I pray that you would please help us to stay strong and to lead our lives by example, dear Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.